I think episode 13 of Bro Research Radio, and we've been talking a ton about training volume. So Ryan and I thought it'd be good to get on the horn and talk a little bit more about food volume, uh, which is it, it's generally talked about because overweight and obesity is so prevalent. This issue seems to get talked about in, in only one way, but we want to talk about it from kind of both ends of the spectrum. Um, and so the, the first thing to really talk about is like why food volume matters. And I think this is the, the big debate between if it fits your macros and kind of the, the people who harp maybe paleo or people who harp really hard on food quality. And we have to acknowledge that both of these things matter. So like calories, they matter. Um, whereas food quality also matters. And so food volume is, is one way that our body responds, like our appetite. So evolutionarily, we're not really meant to deal with all of these hyper palatable, hyper dense foods. Like honey was the most energy dense food we would have seen. That was like 3.2 calories per gram. As you look at like your Scandinavian swimmers, like what are, if we look at the back of those, like how many calories do they have? I mean, it's probably, they're probably, not, they're probably not that high, but they're probably at least like upper threes. You got 39 grams of carbohydrate per 42 grams of food volume. All so right, that's so about as dense as it gets. They're going to be around four. Well, that, well, when you throw in fat in the mix, like you have an RX bar, which is a multi, like a, those are pretty easy. Like any kind of gummy bears or anything like that, they're going to be primarily carbs without a lot of fiber. And so th those would probably be close to four on RX bar like which we would think is like whole 30 approved very very healthy right that's has a that has energy density of about 4.3 calories per gram and so that that's a high energy density food and so when people are trying to lose weight it, and there's a lot of confounders here and, and we both do this is we're trying to get people to essentially eat less calories but eat more food and that's that's kind of how you do that with the with with food volume um and and this is people are all and this is kind of my biggest worry with the energy density thing and i don't know if you've seen this with your clients is like if we all of a sudden blast people you know with three pounds of vegetables a day and then they get used to eating this insanely high volume of food and then they cheat it seems to me anecdotally that they have to eat an insanely high amount of hyper palatable foods to feel full as well hmm. so that's interesting i've actually never really thought of even asking anyone that um, because none of my clients have ever gone off the diet ever. Um, you know, they're, they're always perfectly adherent. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a, that's an interesting point. I mean, you are going to get used to just that, uh, expanded volume in the gut. So, and that is part of the hunger signaling or fullness signaling, right? So do you want to kind of speak to some of that? Like, why, why do you think that may be? Well, cause, so it's definitely going to, having more food volume is going to acutely make you feel more full. That's why we have like, if you look at all the preload research, so having people eat a salad or soup or something with that has a low energy density before a meal, they'll generally eat less overall calories at that next meal. So when we're dieting, these are all tools that we can use. And so there's a lot of compounders that come with energy density, right? So people are, if you have more food, you're generally going to eat more slowly um, you're going to have more fiber. You're going to have more water content in your food. And so these are all things and we, in research, they try to pick apart because they want to know is energy density a thing or is it all these other things? We don't necessarily care, care about that in practice. We kind of want all those confounders to come with it. Um, we want, we want the nutrient density. We want, you know, we probably do want a higher water content and, and those, so that's, that's can be really, really helpful. And, and helping people and the weight loss research is, is pretty solid in terms of like if you get people to use a higher nutrient dense lower and en lower energy density diet they're generally going to maintain weight loss a lot better and that makes sense to me because it it when people start adding these higher energy density foods back in from a weight loss perspective they're generally not they're, they're not super successful um because they they can't these things are hard to moderate our body like if you i remember i was at um, I think we were at Moonshine, and I asked the waitress. I'm like, they they brought out the peanut butter, the the infamous peanut butter pot. Yeah, yeah the, the <laughs> peanut butter pot that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, no, I know all about it. Yeah. <laughs> never seen it, never tasted it. And so I asked the waitress. I was like, so how many calories in this thing? And she's like, oh, probably like 150, 200. I'm like, there's no. Way. 
<laughs> Maybe they're using PB2. Dude, dude, there's no way. This thing was like a thousand calories. And so like people are just really anything above 1.5 calories per gram, we really have no hope of estimating like how dense it is. And so that's one of the one of the problems is is people are gonna be unsuccessful because evolutionarily we're not meant to encounter these these combinations of fat and carbohydrates. Um so they can really deter a diet from a weight loss perspective. But I think from both of us, so my methodology is is always to kind of create these these skeletons of a diet with behavior change and, and food selection, and so that they have a high volume of food in, in their meals. So they're eating high quality meals. And both of us kind of intuitively do this. We eat a lot of vegetables with our meals. Um, we'll, we have to eat a lot of food, so there are there is going to be a carbohydrate source there. But if it seems to be easier if you set up this skeleton or this this base of of high volume food choices, and then if you, if you have a weight gain client, then all of a sudden I start adding more energy dense foods on top of that. Because if I try to add more sweet potatoes and you're already eating you know six pounds of food a day, it's just not generally going to go well. And mm. not to mention that you we really have to be cognizant of of this eating clean mentality, especially with weight gain, because I mean, chimpanzees can eat about a hundred grams of fiber. Maybe our ancestral pale, maybe they did eat that much fiber. Um, but the majority of us are not going to be able to deal with that much fiber, especially acutely. Like you're not going to like raising fiber from 30 grams to 70 grams is a really, really bad idea. But I think a, a lot of people in this, in this exercise nutrition world, they have a lot of digestive symptoms. And they don't like to talk about them. And I think one of the reasons is they're eating probably too clean and their fiber intakes are through the roof. And so finding your fiber threshold um, can be really, really helpful. And, and it's not – fiber is, is – maybe it's going to help against colon cancer. There's some things that, yeah, like it's going to help for your gut microbiome. Like these things are important. But we always go with this more is better type thing. Um, and that might not be the case, especially with those fermentable carbohydrate sources. Soluble fiber sources are, are like psyllium husk tends to do better in like the IBS research. Um, but those are, this isn't necessarily a simple answer. Like, yes, food volume is important, but it, there's, it's super contextual. And, and so that's, I think if we're thinking about weight loss, we can use a lot of this stuff in, in terms of preloads and, and increasing the overall density of the diet. And I think that's what we're after. But we do have to be be careful because there's probably there's probably a point of diminishing returns, right? Um, because if you get someone eating, you know, six pounds of food and then they decide that they don't want to eat that way anymore, now they're going to need, you know, maybe they only need four pounds of food. But if you eat, you know, four pounds of McDonald's, that's not gonna <laughs> that's gonna be a lot of food, yeah, a lot of calories. Yeah, and not to mention, like, I, I think that a a mistake that often people make when they're dieting. I know this is something that I've done in the past um, and a lot of my clients have done and people just intuitively start to do is you start to eat these uh, more voluminous foods thinking that it's going to fill you up more, but you're also losing some amount of uh, caloric intake by doing that. If you switch from white rice to sweet potatoes, now you're picking up extra uh, or some of those carbohydrates are coming from fiber now. Uh, not like Now there's going to be more of a digestive cost to, to eating it. So it, it ends up being a bigger loss in terms of caloric intake than you actually think it is. And that can have a, a, a pretty big impact on just hunger levels in general. Like I think that we, we tend to look at things in the acute sense of just like how full can I feel right now? Uh, and then not thinking about later in the day, if like you just change from, like you said, 30 to 70 grams of fiber, uh, that could be a significant amount of, of uh, carbohydrate that you're missing out on now, uh, especially if you're a smaller human being. Um. yeah let's 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 just look real quick and see like so say someone say you got someone eating like a pound of white rice a day and then you you want to they're gonna they all of a sudden want to go paleo and they want to eat you know they want to eat sweet potatoes so a pound of white rice is not that much uh it may sound like a lot but um, so that would be like 128 grams of carbohydrates. So if you just switch someone to a pound, like if they're eating a pound of rice a day and they just eat a pound of sweet potatoes a day, they're going to lose, you know, 50 grams of carbohydrates and increase their fiber by about 12 grams. 
So you're talking about it. You're talking there. That's a very, that's a very powerful switch for a weight loss client. Like you're essentially cutting their, their net carbohydrates down by 60. But for a weight gain client, that's a disaster. Like, so say we have to get a dude, like just from a logistical sense, if a guy's got to eat 400 grams of carbohydrates and he's going to do that from, you know, maybe two pounds of vegetables and he's only got sweet potatoes at his disposable, that's going to be, dude, that's going to be, that's going to be five pounds of sweet potatoes. Like that's fucking bonkers. Um, and so that's just, to me, it's, it's, it's more from like a weight gain perspective. It's, it's all logistical. And I think that we really need to, maybe someone can do that for a couple of days on a weight gain protocol, but they're not going to be successful at that long term. And that's the, that's the game that I think we see a lot of these, these clean eaters playing is that they're, you know, they feel bad about eating, you know, Scandinavian swimmers or RX, maybe not RX bars. Like, so that's why I'll use RX bars because they don't have that guilt mentality. Um, even though they are super calorically dense more than Scandinavian swimmers. Um, but people, I don't have to unpack, unpack it as much. And so the, but if we can use those items and, and kind of create a feasible plan for them and then, and kind of break down their barriers, because if they are a weight gain client, they have to be in an excess of calories and their body's not going to want to do that. So then you're going to have to use probably these higher density, hyper palatable foods a lot more. Um, whereas a weight loss client, I mean, if they're eating white rice and you can get them to eat sweet potatoes, or even if you can get them to eat like an apple, like, so what is that? If we changed 16 ounces of rice to 16 ounces of apple, what would that, and apples, I mean, same thing. So that's going to be a net loss of almost 70, 80 grams of carbohydrates by just switching from white rice to fruit. Um, and a lot of times they won't even notice that difference. Unless you're talking to someone who's already very calculated and in, in how they're eating everything and they're counting uh, carbohydrates and macros in general. But if you're talking like an average weight loss client, uh, you know, that's, that's an easy switch. They're, they're not even going to feel that. It's, they'll probably feel better in a lot of ways. They'll probably feel more full. Um, they probably won't eat as much of the following meals. That's, that's like easy money for, for a weight loss client. I think that like to me, increasing food volume, increasing nutrient density and increasing protein intake, those are from the general population. Those are probably your biggest, like people are going to have a lot of success, not even talking in calories. If you can just switch out foods from yep. and, and not, it, you're going to have a lot of success, especially, I mean, it can work with females. If females are smaller, like if you have a five, two female, that's like 120 pounds, like she just doesn't have that many calories to work with. But if you have a 240 pound guy who wants to lose 30 pounds, like he might not even ever need to think of calories. You might be able to just switch things out and get them to wherever you need to be. Um, and you, you honestly got to be careful of probably pushing him too low in calories if he eats too clean. And then he's at this weird place when he's at a, he's at a weight loss stop point or he's, or he's just blowing it out on the weekends cause he's not generally eating enough food. Um, and the, the research on cravings and micronutrients and overall energy intake isn't, isn't super solid. I think like when we get into these behavioral like Q reward type situations that most we're, we're a lot more like animals, like dogs than we want to admit. Like if you see something and then, then you do that other something afterwards, like you see, you go in your house and you always, you open the fridge and you, you eat these this yogurt or whatever it is anytime you come in your house you're going to want to go to that fridge and eat that thing um so appetite is is very it's complex right and it's not just unfortunately it's not our subconscious system has a lot to deal with in terms of regulating and the environment has a huge our own like 50 to 60 percent of the decisions we make are the same every day and so like with food a lot of us use food there's a lot of cueing around food um, cause that makes sense. And, and evolutionarily it's, it's how we were, how we were built. Um, not sure. There was some, you shared with me, um, a pretty interesting study on, uh, preschoolers, right. And how they change the, the food intake for a few days out of the week. And do you want to discuss that study at all now? Do you want to go into that? Cause I think that kind of segues into to that. that yeah. Research. Yeah, a lot of this, so a lot of this energy density research is in kids not for, for a couple of reasons. Like one, um, if, you're, if you're deep into the obesity and epidemic type research, 
the, I, I remember co- going to a public health talk at, at UT and, and this guy who was on all the committees at ILM, he's super, super famous. He was like, we need to stop worrying about adults and we just need to put all our money into kids. And so that's one of the reasons that you see this, a lot of this research kind of focusing on children is like, and the other reason that you see it focusing on children is because they do not have the, their prefrontal cortex isn't developed yet. So they're like, they're little limbic machines. Uh, don't push the button, they push the button. And so, but they, they tend to govern their intake really, really well. Um, like kids who don't have, who aren't exposed to hyper palatable energy dense foods all the time. Um, they tend to govern their intake really well. And so what they did was they took for five days, they just gave, they took their regular diet and then they just, so they had a normal energy density that what they were eating before and they gave them a lower energy density for five days and they gave them a higher energy density for five days. And, and the little kids for the when they didn't even notice, right? Cause it was, the researchers made everything the same palatable. It was the same food volume. Uh, but if it had a lower energy density, it had less calories. So they generally, and they ate it to fullness, like these, they were, they were, it's called ad libitum intake. And so these, these little, these little kids, when they had lower energy density foods, they actually ate at a 10% deficit. And then, which could be a problem, right? Um, over time, but they're probably going to auto-regulate that. Um, and then, but when they're on a higher, higher gen, they're probably going to auto-regulate that on the negative side. Uh, humans are very, very, we're better at auto-regulating in a deficit because we, we, the body has a lot of mechanisms to prevent starvation. We're pretty bad at regulating on a on a on an excess um, or a surfeit of calories, and so the when they gave them these higher energy dense foods, they they ate about five percent more calories than they need, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but over your lifetime, that's going to be a huge huge difference, and so that's that's the big we're talking about these these are kids that aren't even really exposed to that much yet either. There's no emotional ties to eating at this point, likely. Uh, there's not, you know, maybe there's some social stuff going on there. They're in preschool. I mean, so there's, I think that number magnifies over time. Oh, for sure. And, and like, that's why kids are so cool to look at. Cause if you think about like the optimal foraging strategy for, for humans, like we want it, we have always wanted to get the most calories and the most nutrients for the least amount of effort. And so if you look at preferences and like what the, like what they value, it, it's generally a linear relationship between energy density. And also palatability. So if you combine, there's this, there's this crazy fat and carbohydrates together, just can make the brain go bing, ding, 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 ding. And so not that they're addictive, it's just our value system puts a ton on that. And then on top of that, we can't inherently judge how many, how much energy is in there. And so if we eat to what, how much, however much volume that we think we need, we're generally going to overconsume. Um, and so you're going to eat a lot more cookies than you are asparagus. It calories wise, you might eat the same amount, but cookies are going to be a lot more dense and humans are always going to value cookies a lot more than asparagus, especially little kids. Like you look at the, you know, what are the top six things that, that little kids consume? It's, it's pizza, you know, mixed desserts, sodas, all that kind of stuff. And then unfortunately look at like what adults consume and it's nearly the same stuff. I mean, we had it right from the start. Chicken yeah. nuggets are delicious. And we, yeah. So we're doing like, that's the thing, like eating hyper palatable energy dense food is the right evolutionary choice. And so what we're essentially asking people to do is we're actually, we're asking them to make the wrong, wrong decision every day at the grocery store. Um, and that can be, that can obviously be tough, but it, it's definitely doable from a behavioral strategy standpoint, but you got to set your, I think one of the big things that people don't think about is you got to set your environment up for success. And you just, you probably, especially if you're on a diet, you just can't have a lot of these energy dense foods around. Um, and so that makes it for you and I, in, in, in kind of our, the people that maybe really gravitate towards, towards this podcast, that makes it really, really easy to cut. So if you have your, if you have your skeleton of how much volume of food that you have your three meals or however, maybe it's just two meals, however many meals you want to eat in a day, uh, and you have that skeleton and that's already a lot of food volume. Say that's four to five pounds of food. And then all the, the only thing you have to do is probably take down your hyper palatable items a little bit and you're still eating. You're still having these big main meals. You're just not having, you know, you're not having four RX bars a day. And, and yeah, that can, from a behavioral standpoint, that can be tough for a little bit. Um, cause you're just definitely going to key reward off that, but it's a lot easier than, you know, having to manipulate your entire diet. Like you have this, you have this baseline program protocol. And then if you just eat the baseline, you're probably going to lose weight. 
Whereas if you want to gain weight, then you just add on to it. It's yeah. not as complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's why like, you always have to look at the context of everything. And like, I think that the uh, the clean eating group is not wrong in any way. Like there, there's like there's kind of like this battle between like the the macros people and then the food quality people. It's like you use them both together. Uh, you know that like you said like you're 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 accomplishing both things there like you're increasing the the food quality as a means of decreasing intake and it works together like that's one very simple way that you can do it it's not to say that you can't continue to eat hyper palatable foods while you're losing weight either mm-hmm. that that they've, they've proven that that works too like you can lose plenty of weight just eating twinkies but um or potatoes or whatever it is like you can make a diet out of anything but is it going to be successful long term? And that's that's kind of the the trade off, right? And so you can you could eat. I always kind of give people like, what's the decision for that Twinkie? You could probably have you know two pounds of kale. Like, would you? Yeah, you might pick that Twinkie on day one, but eventually you're probably going to want more food. Um, and and that's kind of a the people that we're dealing with that are coming to us understand that. But if you're this is where it's tough because if if you're in the the obesity research like people don't necessarily value that and like think about the price of two pounds of kale versus the price of a hostess cupcake like those are extremely different so it's 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 very privileged for me to see like why like poor like because i work with low-income hispanic populations it's extremely privileged to be like you just need to eat more fruits and vegetables like no they're they're stressed out they can't afford them. Then maybe, maybe they live in a food desert. They're not available. Um, so I, I remember we lived with uh, this lady in Colorado and she was like, we were poor, dude. We were like 23 years old, just dirt poor. And she was, we were renting a fucking bedroom in her, in her attic. And she was, she shopped, she was, she shopped at Whole Foods. And she was like, literally like asked us like, I don't understand why you guys don't shop at Whole Foods. I was like, dude, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm literally, I'm, I remember buying like rent. I'm, I'm literally remember buying like the day after Thanksgiving, like buying like five turkeys and just like trying to, just cause they were on sale for like 69 cents a pound. And then yeah. we ate turkeys until like <laughs> mid January, like Steph was going to kill me. Uh, she was so tick- sick of whole turkeys, but I, the, so the food density thing is, has so much, so many convoluted and so many different contextual things that we, that we generally don't think about, especially when we're, we're dealing with blanket statements. I think a lot of people want to make blanket statements about this stuff, but when you make a blanket statement, think about all of the other repercussions of that, of that statement. And um, so context, context here, I think is, is super, is, is the, always the most important, but here, super, super important. We could, I think one of the big things to talk about here is also one of the things you want to talk about with sugar. And so sugar has four calories per gram. It's generally not going to lead to any satiety, uh, but it can can be pretty helpful um, in terms of eating enough calories. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the big thing question I had is, you know, where is this, where does the fear come from with, with sugar? Cause you, you do hear it a lot and that people are, you know, when I recommend things, even, even just, um, not even just sugar, things that are not, uh, quote unquote calorie are, 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 um, nutrient dense. Even fruit. Know? Like people are scared of fruit now too. Like yeah. bananas, like bananas is going to kill you. Anything, you know, that it, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing. I don't know exactly where it, where it comes from. And, uh, yeah, I, I guess we were just, just discussing, I think we already talked about how, eating so much fiber or food volume when you're trying to gain weight just pra- practically just doesn't make any sense. Like you're just not physically going to be able to do it. There's going to be a huge digestive burden, um, especially reading a lot of fermentable uh, types of fibers. Like that's just going to be a disaster for you and everyone around you. Uh, you know, so I, I think the, the question is kind of, um, is there any inherent risk to consuming a lot of uh these lower micronutrient dense foods or, or more sugar or anything of that nature? Well, I think if you have, if you, if you think like ethically and you have your baseline skeleton, this is going to be harder and harder as you eat less food. So if you're dieting, it's going to get more and more important, right? Cause you just have less food to work with. Um, yeah. But if you're trying to gain weight 
in that context, if we have our baseline of food in our, in that, in our vegetables, our variable, whatever we're doing there, and we've used some kind of app like chronometer or, or we use like um, a, lot of, a lot of these Google Docs that we use, and you, you know that micronutrient content is okay, then, then I think you have a lot more free range to use these hyper palatable foods without any type of, on these, uh, no type of guilt, which is, which can be really, really freeing. And, and the other thing that, so essentially we're just trying to create stop gaps. So there's a lot of fear around sugar because it's, a, it's a very simple story. Just like fat makes you fat and now sugar will immediately make you fat. And so, but sugar, there's sugar's innocuous. Like if you have, if you're, if you're going to get parental nutrition, like you're just going to get glucose put into your bloodstream. Like it's, it's very, it's a very useful thing. Um, and so sugar itself is not bad or good. The, the human body just can't, when you combine sugar with fat, the human body just can't regulate it very well. Just plain sugar, like no one's going to eat spoonfuls of sugar till they're like, that's not very appealing. But when you combine it with other things, it can get super hyper palatable. But the problem the problem, we got sold the glycemic index. And so every, I'm, I mean, even 10 years ago, everybody was worried about the glycemic index, but the glycemic index was only, that was looking at foods inside of a vacuum. So what happens and what happens when you eat white bread versus white rice versus sweet potatoes and looking at the glucose or insulin index of that food. But we don't eat generally sole items. Like, so yeah. the, gl the glycemic index goes out the window when you eat mixed meals. And that's probably the most important thing is like if you eat if you eat some sugar after you if you eat a banana after you have a meal that might that glucose response might be completely different than if you just eat a banana alone and where from an inflammatory like people have this idea that sugar is inherently inflammatory it's not what's inflammatory is a hyperglycemic response and so that's generally you can you can argue about where that is but I would say it's once you you don't want to blast over 160 uh, milligrams per deciliter on a regular basis. I think that's a bad idea. 180 for sure. Um, you're going to start spewing uh, glucose out of your urine. And Tommy Wood talk, Tommy Wood and I talked a bunch about that uh, in that I think it's the the third podcast. And so the but if you're if you're eating whole foods, even if you're eating whole foods and you're eating mixed meals, you're gonna you're probably gonna be fine. Um, and then if you have a ton of muscle and you're using these hyper palatable foods, you're probably also going to be just fine. Um, and I think that's another, we're probably going to produce, like we're probably going to produce a little bit of, maybe we're after a little bit of mitochondrial dysfunction. Not, I don't think it's going to happen because exercise is going to blunt it, but maybe, you know, with, when we're trying to increase calories, like we're trying to do that. Like we're, so there's going to be, a lot of times we like to think that, you know, putting on muscle or doing these things isn't going to have a negative effect. And I don't think over the long term it's going to have a negative effect on, on glucose dynamics. I think it can only have a positive effect. But I think in the short term, like, yeah, you probably want to make sure that you're not just blowing out glucose control with these hyper palatable foods. And that's why I think ethically you want to have this baseline diet of energy dense or energy, yeah, nutrient dense, low energy dense foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I mean, is there? You can measure it for one. Like, the, if the main thing that we're looking at is blood glucose, if that's like, are you saying that's kind of like the the big thing? If you start to blow blood glucose out, that's when you could potentially be having a problem. Yeah. So if you elevate it for too long, right? So, yeah, you're so, going to get a cytokine response if it if it pops up. Like, and you got to think about like what is the definition of of pre diabetes or diabetes? It's getting a 75 gram bolus of glucose. And then two hours later, two hours later, yeah. you're, you're like diabetes, two hours later, you're over 200. Like That's a long time. If you've ever measured your blood glucose, that's a long time to be above two. 160. Holy shit. I don't think I've even hit 160 uh, eating 200 grams of carbohydrates, you know, in a meal. And and not let alone don't know that, the thing we don't know there is insulin. So how much insulin are you secreting to get that job done? And that's one of the reasons that I want to get like OGT, like oral glucose tolerance data on on us like what happens when i give you 100 grams of carbohydrate 100 grams of glucose and and 30 grams of, of protein like well really what happens how much insulin is secreting um and so and then can you can you essentially could what's that insulin response look like after exercise versus like just later in the day um and and i i don't think it's gonna really matter 
in terms of, of athletes. I think that this stuff, like now, if you get into people complete at the other end of the spectrum, like where does, where do continuous glucose monitors, like where do they do really, really well? Diabetic and pre-diabetic populations. Because people can see, they can see the carnival ride that they're, that they're on. Um, where and that's a completely different population too. We, we're talking about people that are looking to build muscle or, or optimize things. And like, I, I think what people forget is like, all of this stuff acutely is bad. Like we're going to yeah. produce inflammation from training. Like it's absolutely necessary. If you don't do that, you're not training. You're like, why would you adapt to something that didn't happen? Uh, like there needs to be some kind of response. So I think people look at these things and they're like, oh shit, like if I eat um, Scandinavian swimmers, my, my insulin's going to pop up. Like, all right, for 15 minutes or you know, like, it's kind of like, I think of like the cortisol stuff and everyone's freaking about out about cortisol. Uh, probably a lot of that has to do with not even really understanding what it does, but it's like this, it's this temporary thing. It's if there's a very big difference between having uh, elevated blood sugar the entire day or having like a quick pop, you know, after training is, is that right? Yeah. Uh, you're like, you want as a human, if we think uh, most of the research is in sick populations. So it's, it's in a very fragile population. Our goal is to be anti-fragile. Our goal is to be like, you should be, I want you to be able to take as, as a large bullet of carbohydrates as I can get in you and not have it be a problem. Like that, that's probably, I want you to be able to deal with large amounts of carbs, large amounts of food and have it not be a problem. Is everybody going to be able to get to that point? Probably not because everybody's different. But if you are, you know, if you're a 200 pound dude and you train six days a week, like these are, this is not something there needs to be little to no fear around sugar or carbohydrates for you. Um, they're just a tool. Now, could you gain weight on a ketogenic diet? Maybe, but you're going to have to drink oil. Um, and, and you're going to, you're going to eat a lot of vegetables. So just inherently in those restrictions, it's going to be tougher. Whereas we're talking about using a lot of these hyper palatable energy dense foods to promote an energy access, which is, which as you're more and more trained, you probably need to be in some degree of caloric excess chronically, um, over time to be able to put on muscle. And that's where we see a lot of the, the, you know, not, maybe not some, I think it still exists. The people that are attached to diet quality, I just see I just see them pendulum swimming all over the place. Like they're, yeah. they're super paleo for five days and they're margarita and tacos for two days. And so and that, that's a really terrible place to be if we're thinking about, cause, cause in the weight room, it's really consistency over time. And so if you want to put on muscle, you don't want to be in a, you don't want to be in a, a crazy ass excess two days a week. You want to be in a little bit of an excess seven days a week. Yeah. And, and, and that's, and that's a much harder thing to do as a human. Because humans don't really acutely regulate their energy intake anyways. Humans' energy intake is regulated in a long time. Because um, that's not how we're, we're not, we don't, even though we like think in 24-hour periods, and, but that's not necessarily what mattered for humans back in the day. Because you have 60 days of energy stored up at least. Uh, the longest person, maybe you got a lot more than that. Even last, our longest person fasted for like 400 plus days. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that to me is, is kind of the contextual framework of what we're trying to do here from a weight gain or weight loss perspective. The weight loss, this stuff is going to be insanely powerful, maybe, maybe our most powerful tool. And then from a weight gain perspective, it might be the biggest thing that stabs us in the back. Yeah, yeah. So just like to, to recap with all that stuff, I, I think setting up some kind of skeleton of your diet that includes some solid quality foods. So you know that you're getting micronutrients that, that you need. Uh, you know that you're getting an adequate amount of fiber. Setting something up like that in Chronometer, as an example, as an app that will actually break all that stuff down. Or maybe even not just, just eating different colored vegetables and shit and just know that you're getting enough. Uh, and then from there, it's like, how else do you want to fill your bucket of, of calories that you need if you're trying to gain weight? Uh, if you're trying to lose weight, your your brain is probably going to regulate that for you. You're probably going to know when it's time to eat, and you know you'll have to kind of fight that battle, as, uh, depending on how far down you're trying to go. Um, but aside, you know, when you're trying to to gain weight, like is there is there any real difference when we're talking about a caloric excess that would be necessary to to put on some muscle mass? Is there any real difference if it comes from carbohydrate or if it comes from from fat? Do, do you see any 
I think if, you, if we're going to think hypothetically, it would be best for those calories to come from carbohydrates um, just because you have less of a – the body's a lot better at turning fat into fat and a, a lot better is, is a, maybe you can turn 90% of those carbohydrates into fat if you overeat them. Generally, the body's going to do the most efficient thing possible. So it's going to – if you eat an excess of calories, um, it's going to turn whatever fat you have that you ate into fat. Um, and so it's probably not going to matter to a super high extent, but I think it's, and if you are eating, it's a lot easier to overeat fat and carbohydrates combined. Um, it's, so that's, that's the, it's a, and people are generally going to under report and we don't, we probably don't want you to get super fat. Um, even though I think that getting super fat could probably be really helpful for a lot of people just because I think they live in this really, maybe not super fat, but like for them to maybe live at 10% and like getting to 16%, maybe the best thing that they ever did because they were, they were never really in an excess of calories because they're in this weird body land, dysmorphia land. Um, and, and that can be tough, but I, I think those are, if we're thinking about where are we going to get that excess, excess of calories, I would just think of feasibility logistics first um, and then try to keep it consistent. The, I mean, if someone's got to eat, like we got, we know guys like you even probably are going to have to go that high, like five or 6,000 calories. Like at a certain point, it's just like fat is just going to be a lot more feasible. I know Ethan right now is he's adding MCTs to a lot of his stuff because MCTs it's, it's harder to convert MCTs to fat. And so he's just getting a lot of his calories there. And if you can, you know, if you think about like even white rice, like you get like how much, how many calories, like, like we can do the math. Like if you're, it's, it's really a lot harder than I think people perceive it to be when you're talking about, because I think when people think of refined foods and they think of sugar or whatever it is, they're, they're thinking about, like you said, those combinations of fat and carbohydrate. So and I that's could, easy to overeat. <laughs> like, I could add. I could add five tablespoons of oil to someone's, to someone's diet for the price of 16 ounces of white rice. That's a big deal. Versus, yeah. versus, you know, if you take that out to sweet potatoes, so like what's the trade off there? So you're talking, you're talking 30 ounces, 28 ounces of sweet potatoes versus 16 yeah. ounces of white rice versus five tablespoons of oil. Five tablespoons of oil or almost two pounds of potatoes if you're trying to gain weight so that's so, that's the energy density that's that's a thing that that's and also like you can see like from a keto perspective like your food volume is going you can do it well you can i'm not saying that you can't do this stuff well but the more restrictions that and that's why i think like chronometer can be really really helpful now it's not it's not perfect none of this stuff is perfect i don't know where you're getting your food so your selenium counts might be a little bit lower like my, none of this micronutrient stuff is going to be perfect but i think if you are stacking restrictions on yourself it's a good idea to use chronometer because you know you might be low in calcium and there's some research that says that humans will eat to get their calcium need or because calcium is the most abundant micronutrient in the human body uh and so like you want to make sure that you're meeting these needs and it's, and some of these things are pretty hard to meet with food. Like potassium is, is per, ask, yeah. potassium is mm -hmm. pretty hard to meet with by eating foods alone. It's definitely possible if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, but it's kind of, especially like you're sweating a ton in, in Texas right now. Those are things that you want to make sure you're getting, you know, you're getting enough electrolytes. Um, and if you're not taking electrolyte supplement, you got to get it through your food. And so those are like, now we talk, we get into the cognitive burden. Now, this isn't something that I would have someone who's just starting a diet do. I think it's just way too much. It's way too much noise for them. But if you're pretty far along the spectrum, you, it's, it's really going to, because people don't eat as differently as they think they eat. So if you have that baseline skeleton of what you normally eat in a week, and then you maybe even two weeks, and you put it in a chronometer, you're going to get a good idea of where you're at. And then you have an option. You can either like, oh, I'm low on zinc. What are some foods that I can get to? And RDAs aren't perfect either. But they're at, least, they're at least a start, and so you can see. And I think that they're pretty good for, like, for Steph. Um, she's got it. She needs like twelve hundred milligrams of calcium a day. Cause she's pregnant because she's got to build a little baby calcium. She got a little build a little baby skeleton, and it's almost done being built. But so she's also got to you know give that baby a lot of blood. So she's got to get more iron. And so these are all things that we're we're thinking about, and we're even worried about right now because when the baby leaves, she has a tendency towards anemia because she has, you know, that's something that, that we've been battling with Steph forever. And it's, 
you know, it's upwards of 60% of female athletes are iron deficient. And so she's literally going to give away two pints of blood during labor. And then she could bleed for four to six weeks afterwards. So how are we going to, you know, get her enough iron to cope with that? And, and iron deficiency is the most common nutrient deficiency there is out there. So when we get into energy density, we, and we get into these food selection stuff, we automatically get into nutrient density. And, and that, those things are becoming easier and easier to check. Now that the checking of it isn't, isn't perfect, but I think it's worthwhile if you have a high nutrition IQ to, you know, check yourself, like how high of a quality, and these are how high of a quality is your diet. Now, these 32 macro, micronutrients and, and minerals, like these are the things that we know matter, but there's probably a lot of other things that matter too. So I think that it, it really is good to focus on real food first. And once you have that real food blanket, then you can kind of, you can, you have a lot more free range to, to get dirty with it. And that, and that dirty can be really, really helpful for people who have audacious um, performance or body comp goals and, and probably even necessary um, for a lot of us. Or even just people that have difficulty digesting a lot of food due to lifestyle choices or whatever. I mean, if you can't sit down and, and eat a meal and you're like, dry, like, I mean, I used to do this shit all the time. Like I'd be driving from one client to the next, like trying to stuff down two, two pounds of potatoes. It's like, that's just not a good environment to be trying to digest that amount of food. So it's some, some, there's some, uh, context where this is just not, this doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, my, my, what I'm thinking about is you're talking about micronutrients and stuff. And I'm just wondering if it's, if you truly have a micronutrient deficiency, I, I, with the exception of iron, I think iron is, is fairly easy to get from food. I mean, you just eat red meat and you know, you might yeah, be able to get covered. You could, yeah. So, um, but with a lot of these things, I, I'm wondering, is it even, would you even be able to, like, if you had a potassium deficiency or something and you knew this, I mean, how many damn sweet potatoes do you have to eat to, to, to make up for that? Is it even worth it? Or do you just get on a multivitamin, get on a multimineral, and then just eat as you can? I mean, how, do, like, how many of these, these micronutrient deficiencies can you even make up with, with food? I think given, given the amount that we don't know and given the, the not-so-stellar results of multivitamins in, in the literature – I would say that we probably want to get as many of these things through food as possible. I think that's the, I think that's the judicious thing to do. I think that's, that's the, that's the right thing to do. Um, and then you fill whatever you need. Now, I don't think a multivitamin is going to hurt anyone. Um, it's tough to look at this stuff observationally because people who take multivitamins are inherently different than people who don't. But there are RCTs on multivitamins, and they don't generally have – they don't have the robust effects that people are going to think they have. Now, yes, these multivitamins are probably like centrum silver, and they're like shitty formulations. But it's not the end-all, be-all that you think it's going to be. Now, micronutrient deficiencies are really, really hard to measure. Um, I, don't think, I don't think a multivitamin is going to hurt you, but a multivitamin with Twinkies is a lot different than a multivitamin – or not even using a multivitamin. So think about a multivitamin with Twinkies is going to be inherently a very, 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 very different diet than someone who's looked at meeting all of their micronutrient contents through food. Um, and, and so it's, it's not as hard as, as people think. Like some of this stuff, like, yeah, if you're sweating a ton, um, you remember when Pat was in the jungle, I was, I was just trying to give him as many electrolytes as possible um, because he was, he was just losing so much, so much sweat. And so, if you're, some things are harder to get than others. Some things are really, really easy to get if you're eating mixed food and you're eating vegetables. But some things that are pretty hard to get are, you know, vitamin D, pretty much impossible through food. Um, calc if you're vegan, good luck getting enough calcium, good luck getting enough magnesium, good luck getting enough zinc. Like these are just notorious, good luck getting enough B vitamins. So as you stack in paleo, Vitamin D and calcium are just generally pretty low. Now you can make the argument, there's this argument that you don't need as much calcium because your acid burden is lower, but that's bullshit. Um, I think that you, one of my biggest qualms with paleo is, is in, you know, females who need to be really, really cognizant of how much vitamin D and calcium they're getting for their bones. Like, because osteoporosis is probably one of the biggest things for them. I want to see a bone mineral density scan in females over 35. Like I, something I want to see, maybe even like younger than that, especially if you've used, like if you were vegan when you were little, like I want to see that stuff. Um, and so that being cognizant of these, of these big player 
um, vitamin, vitamins, minerals. And then you got things like iodine, which is just tough to get through food if you're not eating seaweed. And so there's just, there's just some stuff, folates, like if you're not eating green vegetables, choline, hard to get if you're not eating eggs. Like these are, there's some, like if so, if you can't eat eggs, you probably need to take a choline supplement. So there's a lot of things like if once you understand what food has what, you can kind of use food almost as almost as a vitamin supplement. Like, oh, you, you're, you're lacking. And I can kind of even look over time of doing this for way too much, way too many years. I can even see someone now, I can kind of see somebody's diet and I'd be like, oh, you're probably low in this. Um, but that's taken a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it still just comes back to that same thought process of just having a, a skeleton of nutrient dense foods and then working off of there based off of what your goal is and, and what's feasible for you. Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's my play that I've come to over all the time that I'm doing this is, is for, especially from a behavioral standpoint, is like if people know that they have, like, this is what I do. This is, this is my, like, I might have days that are different than this, but this is my, this is normally what my day looks like. I eat, you know, 16 to 18, I eat 16 to 20 ounces of vegetables with lunch and dinner. Um, Cause that's generally when people are going to eat their most vegetables. And, and I have, you know, I have a good portion of what, maybe I'm not eating carbohydrates cause I'm trying to lose, maybe I'm not eating a grain or something like that. Um, cause I'm trying to lose weight, but I have, I have meat, I have vegetables at every meal. Um, and then I kind of, I can add off that depending on the person. And, mm-hmm. um, and so that, that's been really, really helpful for me. And then just having places that people can, can go back to essentially thinking of it like you're climbing this mountain and then you have these, you have these stairs that you can kind of go back to these points that you can, um, whatever they would call that in mountaineering. Um, the, <laughs> ask, yeah. Rava, ask Rava. Uh, <laughs> uh, I knew that word. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how I, that's how I think of it. And that's, it's kind of the art of this too, is like, once you get into the contextual world, there's this argument like that once you have so many options, it's really hard to make decisions. And, and so that can be, that can be tough for, if you want to be on our side of this, working with clients is like, Hey, if I have this, I have, if I have a thousand decisions that I can make with this person, how do I make, how do I make one? And I think the big thing is like, you don't make it, you let them make the decision. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And- yeah. That's what I always do. If I'm going to sit down and, and we're going to talk nutrition with somebody, it's going to be that type of conversation. It's like, all right, well, tell me what you eat. And uh, let's start with that. Tell me when you eat and I'm not going to design something you're going to make it. And then we can talk about adjustments from there. But it, yeah, it's, it's like the, the, the best meal plan in the world is really not great if it doesn't work for your lifestyle <laughs> or if you don't like to eat that shit, you know, or like whatever it is. So. There is no ideal meal plan. That's the, like everybody wants an ideal. There's no ideal meal plan. There's only the plan that you, that works for you. That's going to, and that plan might be different today than it is from three months from now. And so that's, yeah. that's the hard part about this. And, and I think the nutrition aspect of what we do is even a lot, a lot harder, a lot more complicated than the training aspect. Of, yeah. So when we think about when we get in, you can, you guys can kind of already tell like, yeah, there's a lot of nuances about training volume, but the nuances surrounding food volume are way, way more intense than the nuances about training volume. Um, and you could argue that at a certain point, this food stuff, this nutrition and lifestyle stuff may be even more important than a lot of that training volume stuff. And mm-hmm. it may, it may allow you to push the training volumes a lot more. And if, if it's needed for you to kind of adapt. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. How do you, like, I'm just, how do you typically approach that stuff if you have, cause the, the biggest issue seems to typically be social stuff. And there's a, kind of a couple different ways of looking at this and, from we we'll talk about it in a weight loss perspective because I think for gaining weight it's it's not as big of a deal. I think typically when you're trying to gain weight, the problem becomes um, I'm I'm going out to eat, so I just kind of like forget about the other foods that I'm eating the rest of the day, and you end up not eating enough. And, and that's pretty simple. Like just just eat more. Like we'll forget about those people. Um, so that means I'm not going to get talked about myself. Unfortunately, yeah, they piss we piss everybody off. Like oh yeah, you went, yeah. You, you ate an entire pizza. Like, uh, yeah yeah, I eat sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that's fairly simple. That's just like, you know, being on top of your stuff and knowing what you've eaten and, and making sure that you're getting enough. But when, when it comes to, to weight loss, that's a completely different thing. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach it. You know, like you could say, all right, well, I know that this person, the weekends are just shot. 
Um, so maybe I try to make up my caloric deficit during the week. That could be good, but if you're talking about uh, you know an ex lacrosse player who now works a sedentary job, who still has the same appetite that he had when he was 19 years old, I mean, he could easily blow it out of the water or even very, like a very small individual. Um, like it doesn't take much to get into a, a thousand calorie surplus at the end of the week with just a couple of meals. So how do you approach this? Is there any one way that you approach this or like, how do you go about like, what's your thought process of for a weight loss client, social things get in the way typically of their, their uh, food plan and, and how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. Social eating is really, really tough, especially for females because, um, you, you'll even see this at flow when like when we're in the food line and then there's females in the food line, it's really, really hard for them because so like we're taking in, we're taking just a ginormous amount of food because we need it, but they don't need that much food. So there's this, there's, there's definitely this social pressure on eating more food. And so the, the big thing that I try to do, and, and I don't, we, the least intrusive that the diet can be on the person, that's the best, that's the best case scenario. So like the worst case scenario would be like you hold yourself out and you might, and you did at a certain point, you're probably going to inevitably do this is that you hold yourself out in a cave and you don't go, you don't go into these situations because it's uncontrollable. But I think that for me, I'm trying to control the uncontrollable at least as much as possible. And I'm trying to limit choices because the number, if they have, if they have too many choices, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, I'm going to state like, don't go to a place where they have chips in the beginning. So like anything where you can absentmindedly eat a carb and a fat together going to be bad. Um, and so I would, I would have, this is what I do with people who travel a lot. Um, and if there or people who need to eat out for work, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have them pick three or four restaurants around them. And I'm going to have them pick one or two items that they know fit the bill at every one of those restaurants. And then they can just go to that restaurant and they can order that thing and it's done. They don't have to think. So that's what I'm sure the rest of the menu. I, you, you have what you order and then it's not even, it's not even something that you have to talk about with the other people that you're it, that you're with. Like food can kind of take a back seat to this social encounter and you enjoy it. You like that thing. Um, people are, people are behavior. So if I can create like a, a Q reward system, a Q response reward around, I go here, like you, like I go to Mono Congo, I eat a certain thing in Mono Congo. Like the same thing, you can do the same thing ins inside of someone's social structure. So they don't really miss out anything. Like granted, it's not gonna be perfect because when you go out to eat, there's generally, a, this is in a literature, like a 20% variance about what they say the caloric contact is versus what it is. And, and kitchens want to make things palatable. So they're gonna add more oil to things generally. Um, and so they could be a little heavy handed, but it, it's not the end of the world. At least it's, it's more controlled than, than you go, not having any type of plan, um, and just going out there and being unsuccessful, but maybe having a good time. And the more room you have to work with, the more you can probably do that. Alcohol is another one of those things is dude, it can get real bad real fast. Um, cause there's, you know, alcohol has calories and it's generally popped with sugar too. Um, yeah. And those are real, I don't drink, I haven't drank for a really long time. Um, but those are, those are real issues for a lot of people because when you touch these, these dietary buttons, uh, a, lot of thing, a lot of other things are going to change. And if we don't really take those into account, we're, not, we're doing that, that human a disservice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like that having just looking ahead. And it's the same thing that I'll tell people to do with, with training. Like, well, I don't know where I'm going to lift. Like, well where are you going? Let's, let's have a look. Let's go. I, I learned about this website um, called Google and um, they you can find a lot of things like that. So, and it sounds sarcastic and I don't mean to be a dick, but it's like, it, you can, you can find this stuff out. You know, like if you have any type of control of where you're going to eat, like you can very easily look ahead of time. I can guarantee just about anywhere that you go, you can get some kind of lean protein, some type of vegetables and like, you know, there's going to be some amount of discipline that comes along with this stuff. Unfortunately, like you're, you're going to have to forego that cheesecake or whatever, like, or, or maybe you don't, maybe you just have like something, something else. Maybe there's like sorbet on the menu or something, you know, that's a little less caloric. Why, why do you got to put in French words? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, sorbet, I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, like you could go French and just have sorbet. Like there's, there's certain things like you just, if you have some amount of preparation going into it, it just makes it a lot easier. Making decisions on 
at the moment is a lot more difficult than having some time to think about it on your own beforehand and then just going in and then not having to do it. Just, if you're if you're hungry and on a diet and you don't have any plan, it's <laughs> it's not gonna end. It's generally it's not, not gonna end well. It's not a diet anymore. Yeah, the diet is the diet is over immediately. Yeah. <laughs> So I, yeah, and, I like that those, a lot. Those lost days can be okay if it's just a lost day. But I think for a lot of people, what we don't recognize is that like that's a lost week or potentially a lost two weeks. Um, and it's, if you don't have a lot of room to work with, and unfortunately that generally tends to be, you know, the people that want to lose weight the most, the female weight loss population. It's just a, it's just a harder, it's not impossible. It's just a harder thing to do. Um, just because inside of our obesogenic environment, they need to eat less calories. Um, and they just don't have as much room to work with as that 200 and something pound guy who wants to lose 30 pounds. That's a lot easier thing to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, anything else you want to talk about in, in terms of energy density and, and how many Scandinavian swimmers you can eat in a day? I mean, I can talk about Scandinavian swimmers all day, but, uh, I got, I got a whole bash of waiting for me right here. Um, I think, I think that was just about everything uh, i just want to check my notes real quick oh we didn't talk about water content of food i think that so okay, yeah. i use a lot of um i use a lot of zucchinis and a lot of cucumbers um kind of because i don't really like drinking water but if you think about it zucchinis and cucumbers are 90 percent water and so if i eat a pound of cucumbers i probably just got a good 12 ounces of water and so that's another thing that people don't think about with the, this, the hydration nazis like if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables you can get a lot of water from your fruits and vegetables um and so that can be really you might be able to pull off like you know 30 40 ounces of water just with fruits and vegetables now you can the research on water preloads is not as good as like salad preloads um but yeah and i don't think you also don't have to worry about drinking water with a meal hydrochloric acid is not that sensitive but the that's that is a thing so like when we're thinking about energy density the primarily the primary things that make food less dense are going to eat water and fiber and so cooking is going to reduce water contents so inherently as you cook food it's going to have less weight um so that's that can be really really good from a digestive standpoint uh you can't really function on a raw food vegan diet like that's a great way to die maybe not die but it's a great way to waste away um because humans are evolved to eat cooked foods but you might be able to eat, you know, 50% raw and 50% cooked vegetables. Um, and so those water contents are, are, are kind of a big deal in terms, and that's why I think like one of the things that we do a lot at Flow is, on, it is a higher FODMAP food, but not as high a FODMAP as people think. We'll do like, we have cabbage salad with every meal. And so you- Ask, ask Pat Davidson how he feels about cabbage. <laughs> I don't think Pat Davidson has even smelled the cabbage since uh, he was there two Julys ago. He, yeah, he so definitely much. didn't. He definitely didn't partake. But I think like even when like, he had to, he did. Yeah, like when I was, I I did really well during that. I just ate. I ate a salad. I ate a big cabbage salad first, and then I ate my meal. Um, and that can be that can be a really really helpful thing for people. And if you have like, I thought it was. If you have a mandolin, it literally takes like like two minutes, and you can just bam, you got a really nice looking um, salad. You could, and I think that's the easiest way that I've found. Um, now, if you don't do well with cabbage, it's not it's not a play for you. But if any way that you can get these higher water content foods, and then also paying attention to fiber, the fiber threshold, find your individual fiber threshold. And if you have digestive issues, I think the first thing that you want to do is play with lowering FODMAPs. Um, and that's not a hard thing, um, with Google. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I found just, uh, anecdotally with a lot of my clients that that's, that's been such a big thing is I often have people that have digestive issues and they'll, I'm looking at the diet and like, dude, you're eating like 80 grams of fiber a day. Like, no wonder. Yeah. They're uh, just, just eating bags of frozen broccoli. Like, like you're going to get, yeah. real, you're going to get real trouble real fast. It, the yeah. amount of people that just crush broccoli, um, is, you need other vegetables and like broccoli's not gonna <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can't just eat you can't just eat the california mix every meal for the <laughs> it's a medley uh, <laughs> of, of uh, carrots and, and broccoli yeah yeah and one thing I don't, I don't think that we really touched on too much i'm thinking about um just digestive issues and stuff and often you'll see people that have uh digestive issues when they go too low in caloric intake just in general 
And I don't know if you want to just touch on that quickly, kind of what's, what's going on there. I know that's kind of multifactorial. I would think to like, I know that you're going to get a lot of, I, I would think that's mostly like nervous system related. So you're going to, you're going to get and Cause the, it could be a lack, just an overall lack of food volume, overall lack of soluble fiber so that you just don't have that much bulk in the stool. Uh, but you do, I think you get a lot of like diarrhea type symptoms, like a lot of IBS type symptoms when people are cutting. A lot of, yeah, yeah. They'll hit that and just, uh, and just generally like, um, just digestive, just upset stomach. Just, and I, I, my thought process is just like, you're just not moving stuff out quickly enough. And particularly yeah, if you're constipation eating- seems to be a big thing, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, I think like it's what I, what I do myself and what I have a lot of people do as they get further into contest prep is we start to pull out more of that fermentable fiber sources just because I, I, my theory at least is just has more time sitting in the gut because you're not clearing that stuff out as quickly as you, as you typically are. Um, I don't know if that makes any kind of sense, but, um, it seems to be able to handle generally insoluble fiber will increase transit times. Um, that's why I think a lot of this stuff is, is neural. So if we think about digestive, like, uh, moving food through the GI tract that has a couple components, water, fiber, and then neural tone. Um, so I think a lot of this is just governed by, yeah, as you become more and more starving, you're going to become more and more stressed out inherently. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you like food necessarily is going to change it at that point. Like you'd have, you need food, uh, this caloric increases at that point to, tr- to really change that. I think maybe some soluble like psyllium husk. So I'd be interested like that, yeah. that tends to do pretty well with IBS. Like, yeah, they don't do well with these fermentable fiber sources, but they tend to do pretty well because soluble fiber is going to add bulk to the school stool. Um, it's generally not going to result in gas. Um, it's, so that that could be something it also it's also not gonna have any calories so it, they could just like dump that on something that yeah. would be something that i would try um i know we used uh, we use some kind of pro kinetic with you um, yeah modal, modal pro or which is like a serogenetic kind of pathway or something yeah that 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 i've need to help a ginger i think it was like a heavy ginger like uh i forget exactly what was in it but that was that was helpful i've had a few people use that, that with success yeah it's it, it's kind of this like it's this question that is a very niche question and i think it's 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 probably just gonna happen it's just a matter of when and then how you can deal with it yeah yeah mm-hmm. and probably not like that's where this you really got to be cognizant of and be really of these fermentable fiber car, fiber sources and just like do your due diligence and i think the more you do your due diligence beforehand the better you're going to be off when you're cutting because it might go your ability to take from because if you're digestive if we think about this just from a hypothetical sense if your transit time goes down because of neural tone that means that your bacteria are going to have access to those fermentable fiber sources for longer it's one of the reasons that constipation is a problem it's one of the reasons that constipation is related to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and so if if you know that that's going to happen because of these neural changes because you're essentially starving then you can limit those yeah. ferment. You can limit it, and probably not to say that it's not going to do damage, because I think that like starving yourself is always going to be damaging. Uh, but I, the amount of the human ability's ability, the human's ability to recover from that damage is, is pretty amazing. Um, especially the GI tract. Like you think about the GI tract, like it's 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 an incredible, it's an incredibly robust system. Um, like it just remakes itself every three to five days. Like that's fucking bonkers. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there's. There's def the I I would guess the the highest the biggest thing would be like a, just a lack of food volume and then the biggest driver would be that neural aspect. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And yeah, it seems to typically normalize out when when people start eating more food again, and then they can introduce more things. They in those con like a lot of times it just ends up being less options uh, the deeper you get into those things. Like you're right, you know that these foods are going to work, and this is kind of what you have to stick to uh, for the the time being, and then as you uh, start to get normal again, then you can start to reintroduce a lot of those things. Yeah. The more audacious your body comp goal, the inherently the more limited you're going to be in terms of, and then I think that the less limited that you can be the better probably just from uh, but I, I think at a certain point, like just socially and just overall, just like neural positive, like just from a brain perspective, I think you're, you're going to, you're going to have those like sickness behaviors. Like you're going to want, you're going to have a lot of that stuff come that just comes along for the ride. 
Uh, yeah, and I think that, like just to uh, just for clearance here, like I, I don't think that this should be something that is normal, like with weight loss. Like this is not. We're talking at this wow. point, talking like very extreme weight loss. Like th- this is not essential normal. body fat levels. Yeah, if you're feeling this way during your cut for uh, the summer vacation with your kids, like th- then you're doing something wrong. Uh, but <laughs> this is not normal behavior. Uh, like you said, this is very niche. Um, but yeah, that, that's stuff that you should only really experience at a very low level. And if you are experiencing that, then you probably want to uh, rethink a few things. Hold on, hold on. Is, is, is niche French? I uh, need, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tried to Americanize it because I, I thought you were going to make fun of me if I said niche. Is it, is it, is it derived? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's, pretty sure it's. Trump. Well, a niche is a shallow recess. It's a, it's a cubby hole or a pigeon hole. Uh, it's a comfortable, suitable position in life or employment. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have to. Is, we'll maybe do a podcast on uh, is, all the French American words in the vocabulary. Yes, French. The old, yes, French is, is, uh, is derived from, originally from Latin, uh, but you, you failed to, to honor your ancestors there. I'm French Canadian, <laughs> technically, so I don't think that means I have to really answer to anyone. Because Canadians are Canadians don't answer to anyone, or just, I don't think they have, they just kind of do the thing, and uh, no one really seems to bother them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I feel like French. you're pretty nice for a French person. Like all the French people you meet are generally pretty fucking grumpy. Um, so I, I appreciate that. That's that's a trigger. That was a trigger for sure. We just lost all of our French audience. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Great. The, the French Canadian audience that, 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 is st- that is still around just, just, just to look at your Napoleon Bonaparte muscle. So, so offended. You can't, like, it's, it's a, you can't, it's, you know. I mean, Somebody, Justin Bieber is Canadian. Be so this is, a Canadian, this is a Canadian haircut. <laughs> the classic Bieber I stand by. I've I've been supporting since uh, I was twelve years old. But you don't like uh, anytime I throw on Bieber in the weight room. You're you're not you're not down. Well, it's because that's that's all you know. His commercialized. Uh, <laughs> you got the underground Bieber tracks. Yeah, yeah I mean, like you got to go back to his. Are they in French? Yeah, <laughs> 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 he's straight from Montreal. Uh, yeah, no, that's. Uh, I don't get down to new stuff. You know, I'm I'm an original fan, original haircut. No tattoos. I got a little dirt on my shin, but uh, you know, I hope we're, we're going to cut this part out. I, I oh, absolutely not. All right. Um, so we appreciate you guys. If you're still, if you're still around, this has been a fun episode. We kind of went a lot of pathways. We definitely covered what we wanted to cover. Um, and this is episode 13. We're probably going to be back pretty soon. Um, maybe even this week to talk about uh, training repeatability. I think that's uh, I think that's the next topic on the docket. Um, but appreciate you. Thanks for, thanks for sticking around, and uh, we'll do this again. Thanks, guys. Pura vida. Nos vemos. Meanwhile, Ryan will be practicing his Spanish with Ian. Uh, if, Ian if Ian shows up. <laughs> <laughs>